is now my pleasure to introduce the Chief Executive Officer of Hassad Australia, Mr John McKillop. Mr McKillop has the responsibility for the oversight and management of Hassad Australia business, which is 100% owned by the QTAR Investment Authority. He has over 25 years experience in the agricultural sector in various roles including Managing Director of Clyde Agriculture and standing roles with AgCap, Elders, Stanbroke Pastoral Company and Grain Co. He is currently a Director of Dairy Australia, Marcus Old, Oldham Agricultural College and former Director of Meat and Livestock Australia and the Primary Industries Education Foundation. Welcome Mr McKillop. Great. Okay. Great. Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, uh, members of the staff, uh, and of course students, who it's all, which is what it's all about um, at any agricultural college or university. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the Student Association for, for organising these events and particularly for inviting me here today, um, and, um, and of course for Christine as well for extending the invitation. It was a long drawn out process. Um, to try and find a date. It's, not the, uh, it's always not easy to get to Western Australia, but um, I, I managed to fit it in with some other things, so really appreciate the opportunity and, and really pleased to be here. Um, and thank you to everyone else for, um, for turning up uh, and listening. I hope um, I work on a 10% rule. If, if I find about 10% of people are asleep, I'll, I'll, I'll draw it to an end. Um, I've got to confess it, I, I'm somewhat intimidated by the, uh, by the preceding list of speakers you've had here. I'm just looking through it before and I saw Ross Garno, Colin Barnett, y you know there's some probably more infamous than famous ones there such as um, Brian Burke and John Elliott but you know I'm, I'm hoping I don't get put into that category by someone in about 10 years time saying and one of the more infamous ones of course was John McKillop so <laughs> hope I stay out of that uh, that category. Um, however it was one of the uh, names that really struck me when I went through it was um, and a close friend of mine, um, Neil Linall, who I saw was the second speaker. Um, and I mentioned that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, Neil values education. Uh, he's a guy who is 85 years of age. I actually had lunch with him about two weeks ago and told him I was uh, talking here and he was very excited to hear that. Neil finished his PhD last year at, at the 80, age of 85 on the contribution of John Kerrin to agricultural policy development. Um, and, and as I said to Neil, what on earth at 80 something were you thinking about doing a PhD for? Um, are you thinking of a next career? He said, I, I just found it interesting. I like to be stimulated. I like to learn. And I think that's, that commitment to longer term education, I think, is, uh, is the key to your success going forward in your education. The other reason I mentioned Neil, of course, I, and I often relay this story to him. I grew up in central west New South Wales in the Macquarie Valley and uh, at about the age of 10, um, I met this person at the Macquarie Merino Field Days. Um, he was the compare, the host of the landline program. Um, and I was standing on this place of Raby Station out in the lagoon there and I met this Neil. I was nervous to meet him. He at that time was the most famous person I'd ever met. And, uh, and many years later we're still very much, we <laughs> probably had 30 years where we didn't see each other but then um, we remain close friends today. Um, I mentioned Neil again, I think he's a really good example of what a career in agribusiness can be. It, it doesn't have to be owning a farm and I'm talking to a couple of students here today and it's great that you're heading back to your family farms and that's a fantastic opportunity if you can do that. But there are many and varied careers in agriculture and I'd say Neil had a fantastic career in agriculture but he didn't ever own a farm. Neil started out landline, um, then went on to say well his, his skill strength is in communicating to farmers and communicating to the agribusiness um, sector, so he established a company called Cox Inall. Now Neil's well and truly out of uh, Cox Inall now, but that name and that company remains probably the leading um, agricultural communications company to today. So Neil's created a legacy that will live on well past his time um, in the agribusiness sector, but as I said, never actually ran a farm. So um, I'm going to try and make this work. Look at that. So. I was just going to give you, a, I was going to indulge a bit today and just give you an overview of my career. And I'm going to give it to you, the good, the bad and the ugly. You can say, holy hell. Um, I want to talk a bit about understanding corporate agriculture, um, uh, an overview of Hassad um, and, and a bit of an update on that. And then some of the lessons that I've learned along my way, um, both in, in a career-wise and also within an agricultural investments pro, pro, 
um, sense. So, family farm. Uh, quick summary. Um, my early ambition after finishing school was to go back to the, uh, the farm of Western New South Wales. Uh, my family had been in that district since they came out from Scotland in 1838. And somehow every generation had managed to get on and own their own block or, or go back onto the original block. Um, and so I just thought somehow that would happen. Um, you know, what I hadn't really thought through after finishing Ag College at Orange, which is now part of Charles Sturt as well, um, is, that, is that I had four siblings. We had very little off-farm assets. So somehow, how was I going to end up with this viable farm and, and not in debt to my own eyeballs? So I stayed in that path until I was about 27. Um, and then I think at that point I realised that perhaps this wasn't going to happen or I couldn't see it and I suppose I was reasonably risk adverse and I thought, let's go off and do something else. So off I set um, at the age of 27 um, with, a, uh, with a diploma in farm management. Um, I couldn't take that to a degree at that point. I had to go back and do the whole start again if I wanted to go up and upgrade my skills. So the first job I got was as a rural financial counsellor in New South Wales. Uh, this was dealing with farmers who were in financial difficulties, often taking them through a journey about their options and what they could do. But in reality, in probably 90% of cases, it was helping them exit out of the industry. But you had to let them make that decision and you had to go through the whole process to get them to that point. Sometimes that would be two weeks, sometimes that would be a year. And sometimes people never got there. Um, look, it was a really good role, um, certainly developed skills in negotiation and, and analysis. Um, but you, become, you, be, you develop a very jaundiced view of what agriculture is. You just think it's all negative and people are going broke left, right and centre. So um, I decided that after three years, that was probably enough for me. So I um, went off to start studying and um, started the six year degree through Charles Sturt Uni, Bachelor of Business. Um, uh, so, uh, and then over the next 11 years, I studied continuously, um, part time, married, uh, probably four or five, three or four different jobs in that time, two kids in that time, and I, and I hated it, you know, I, but I looked at it and thought, if I don't do this, I've got, I've got, I've got 10 years to hate doing it, well not didn't hate it all, it's hard slog really, it's hard slog, studying externally, working full time, but then I thought I've got 30 or 40 years to regret not doing it. And I don't want to be out there in a competitive environment against other people who have degrees and have masters and feel that I'm not going to get that role or I'm not going to get that promotion because someone else has got that competitive edge on me. So, um, so I, uh, I um, did complete those, all, all those studies. I ended up, just cut that off, I did Bachelor of Business followed by the CPA program. I thought I wanted to be an accountant. Quickly cured, cured of that after finishing that program. I then did a uh, graduate uh, certificate in agribusiness through University of Melbourne and then did my um, MBA through um, Deakin Uni. Um, then, luckily, at the end of uh, the start of 2000, new decade, new millennium, I secured a job in KPMG in consulting. Um, and I'd met those people at KPMG whilst at a networking function. And I'll get on to why I mentioned that a bit later on. To be honest, KPMG is probably the, the role where I have felt the least comfortable and I probably struggled the most. Um, I, I wasn't, it was an awesome environment to work in, their quality assurance is so, is so fantastic, the brand is so fantastic, um, but coming in there as an agribusiness person was a really hard slog because it's not really how they work. Generally, for the last three or four years before that, I'd been a, a skill generalist, but a industry specialist. I'd always worked in the agri space and I could do a little bit of econometric modelling, I could do a little bit of corporate finance. You get into those organisations and they are very deep on skills and they set across a, a sect, different sectors across those skill sets. I struggled with it. Um, but I was doing work and someone took me under their wing and I think that's also important that you find someone who takes you under their wing and they, and they teach you what they know and they introduce you. And I was very lucky to that someone in the corp finance division said, you've got some skills in agri, why don't we uh, work together on a couple of projects? Luckily, one of those projects was Grainco, um, working for a guy called Campbell Newman, probably wouldn't mean much over here. Campbell ended up becoming the Premier of um, Queensland not long after. Uh, Campbell then offered me a job um, at Grainco, and uh, so I was out of there pretty quick. <laughs> so um, one of the things I worked on there was, was really mergers and acquisitions. Um, you know, so this is probably seven or eight years after having left the small family farm and suddenly I'm dealing in this world of mergers and acquisitions on, you know, 10 and, no, it's probably a $120 million merger at that time. Um, 
What it turned out to be, of course, was one of the first of the four times in my life that I would work myself into a redundancy. Um, because that, that uh, merger was with Graincorp. And, uh, and I was just talking about it with one of the Graincorp people the other day. It was a merger by name only. It was actually a takeover. So, so no, nothing of Grainco exist, existed a month after that takeover. I was lucky at that point that a role came up at Stanbroke Pastoral Company. Um, Stanbroke is... Um, it was awesome. You know, Stanbroke was this 100% owned by AMP. Uh, it ran 520,000 head of cattle, 13.7 million hectares, um, you know, across all the Northern Territory, Queensland. You know, I came, we ran 80 cows at home, you know. <laughs> so suddenly I'm here, that, you know, that's, that's, that's the death of one day for one station. It was incredible. And part of the appeal of that, oppor of that opportunity that came up was that I was going to get paid to go and see parts of Australia that most people would pay to go and see. You know, um, so we had the luxury of, of travelling around a lot of that place, staying out on station, um, seeing sites like that. That, that is a, um, an actual photo of, at Helen Springs. It's quite a famous photo. There's about four people claimed to have taken it. I think it is actually uh, John O'Kane was the manager there, there at the time. That is 17 triple trains lined up, um, and they did that lift out of Helen Springs, uh, Wade, Catherine, discharged Darwin, then came back again for the second half of the shipment. <laughs> so, so that that road train of uh, that 17 road train triple road trains lined up there did that twice in three days, and then the ship sailed off. Um, a, a scale that I've never come across before in my life uh, to see that sort of thing. One of my responsibilities I had was the, um, the feedlot and the backgrounding operation. The feedlot was 10,000 head. Um, I learned a lot. I listened quickly. And it, and it dawned to me that management is not about having technical skills. Man management's about bringing it together. It's about bringing a team. It's about creating a vision. Because I'm not a cattleman. You know, I'm, I know a little bit, but with 100 cows <laughs> before this, I didn't have to know it. But what I realised I had to know was actually ha what the questions to ask. And, and how to build that team and how to build a vision around that team. Um, so um, part of my role, oops, went the wrong way, did I? So part of my role then uh, was, again, looking for acquisitions on top of the feedlot and the, um, and the backgrounding operations, was to look for, for acquisitions that we could make bolt-ons to the operation, particularly on the downstream activities such as branded beef, and we even had retail at one point. However, in 2004, AMP um, decided to exit. Uh, second <laughs> divestment. So my role effectively was to do myself out of a job as, as well with that one. Um, it sold to, it was, it'll be one of those things that remains in history. Maybe it wasn't as much over here, but in, uh, in the East Coast, it was fairly big news and for a long time because it was, a, it was the biggest deal in, in agriculture at the time. It's $500 million worth. In fact, it sold for $490 million uh, Peter Managazzo was the 50% uh, owner. Peter had no intention of ever holding 50% of the shares. He just wanted 50% of the properties. That was going to be an issue because the other 50% saw that they were buying shares. So they went into, um, into a lockdown straight away, fighting straight away. Peter Managazzo, six months later, uh, paid another $90 million to secure the, the rest of it. So nearly $600 million and Peter owned Stanbroke. Peter, he was born on 14 acres at Werribee, just out of, uh, between Geelong and Melbourne, a vegetable farmer. Tr Peter was a trader. Traded properties, traded potatoes, didn't really matter. I said to Peter at the end of the day, Peter was a fairly simple man, you know, um, obviously smart, but in a very simple way. I said, Peter, you know, did you go through all those spreadsheets that Price Waterhouse um, Coopers did on the modelling of it? She John, 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 I didn't even read that. I just said, runs 500 head of, thousand head of cattle, it's got to be worth $1,500 a head, including the cattle. If I buy it for less than that, it's cheap. I went, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So no spreadsheets. That was Peter. He borrowed a lot. He, he had about $100 million of, of land and water. He borrowed $70 million to put a deposit down, deposit, to then borrow the other $350 million. It was debt on debt on debt. But... Peter walked away six months later after that with about $200 million profit because he sold 80% of it um, and, and the four properties in the feedlot and the abattoir was, uh, was essentially his profit. Um, so um, 
again, I, I learned a lot. Um, and in those dying days of Stanbroke, Peter put me in there as the CEO. Um, it was only for a 12-month contract. It, I knew it was going to be a poison chalice, but, you know, I was 38, 39, someone's dangling the CEO's role of a, the largest cattle company in, in the world in front of you. Uh, I said yes, I took it. Six months later, I was regretting it. CEO of a family-owned business is, a, um, is not a CEO. You know, you are there listening and implementing what the, C what the major shareholder wants. It did allow me to establish my first rule um, in, uh, in career selection. Ne never work for a company where you see the major shareholder more than once a month. <laughs> so, uh, and I've pretty well stuck to that ever since. Um, look, Peter was great, but it was a family-owned business. So um, then a job came up in Adelaide, again, shift the family, moved to Adelaide with elders, um, again, looked after the feedlots, the live trade, um, meat trading, uh, the Chinese business, Vietnam. It, it was a really, again, big introduction into that world. Uh, enjoyed it. But then a, a role came along to run uh, Clyde Agriculture, which was owned by the Swire family out of Hong Kong, London. Um, the Swires had um, a, an investment called Clyde Agriculture. It was about... Um, well, we cropped about 30,000 hectares, we ran about 150,000 ewes, um, and we grew about eight or 9,000 hectares of cotton out of Burke. Um, it was a good size operation, incredible culture, the, the Swires. Putting the Swires own Swire shipping, they own Cathay Pacific, they own all, an incredible amount of investments around the world, but incredibly humble people to work for. Um, so um, after three years of restructuring, again, the, the Swires decided to exit it. Um, so uh, again, I set about for the third time in my career to do myself out of a job by selling it. It took us about 18 months. We realised the full $350 million for it. Um, and, uh, and then I decided at that point that um, this had hairs on it. So um, I was going to find something that no one could sell. So I'm going to try and do board rolls. If you do board rolls, then, you know, if you've got 10 of them or five of them, then you lose one. That's OK. You pick up another one. So look, I was fortunate enough, and by that stage, I, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd established myself in the industry, I suppose, and I was lucky enough to pick up a, a board role with Meat and Livestock Australia, um, about the same time with Dairy Australia. Um, got on the uh, council of, of Marcus Olden. It's, it's harder to get off the council of Marcus Olden to get on it, I think, but they, they say it's like Hotel California. You know, you can check out, but just never allowed to leave. But look, it's a fantastic organisation. The Primary Industries Education Foundation, and then, and then a bit later on came the board role at Cubby Station, which had just been taken over by the Chinese, and they needed an independent uh, director on there, and, and so I was put forward for that one. Cubby Station, again, probably, it's probably more famous in the east than the west, but it's phenomenal. <laughs> Cubby Station, it's the one that causes all... If you ask any South Australian, they all hate it, because they just they takes all the water, you know. Uh, but, you know, it has 22,000 hectares of cotton, 50,000 acres of cotton, um, three places, but mostly on that one place at Covey. 12,000 hectares of water storage, which holds 540,000 megalitres of water. If you do that in Sid Arbs, as they call it, Sydney Harbours, it's two and a bit Sydney Harbours of water storage. So the way they've done it is, is, is a phenomenal exercise. The, it, they have a weir, fixed weir, so you can't adjust it. It comes in through these um, series of channels that start off at probably not quite a metre high off the ground, the channels, and they've kept them level for the next 25 kilometres. So by the time you're 25 kilometres out, you're nine metres off the ground. So the whole thing is just gravity fed into these. So it gravity feeds into the storages and then it gravity feeds into the, uh, into the fields itself. 80% of their water isn't, isn't pumped. To put in context, every time you pump water, it's about $17, $18 a megalitre, depending how high you lift it. Many places, like at Burke, we would pump two or three times. They pump their tail water only. It's an incredible operation, love it or hate it, it's, it's an engineering feat what they've done up there. So that photo um, was taken, uh, a, a cotton picking, it was a full crop year. Uh, there are 21 cotton pickers in that, uh, in that photo, all contractors. Um, Paul, the CEO, says, oh no, they just happen to be in the same fields. I, he's probably spent half a day actually lining up that photo, but, but, but each, each one of those machines is worth about 1.1 million each. Um, you know, it's a, it's a phenomenal, and those yellow things, if, if, if no one's seen cotton growing, uh, they are all rolls of cotton. They're like hay bales, except there's about 2.2 tonnes of raw cotton lint in there. Um, and, uh, and they all have an RFID tag in them, and so that marks exactly where that 
uh, cotton was picked up and where it was taken to. So when it goes to the gin, people know exactly where it was from, what part of the field it was in. And of course, they're all yield monitored as well, all the cotton pickers. Um, so um, about that same time, uh, I, I started a group. It's uh, called the Corporate Ag Group. We, we thought, oh, this would just be a temporary name. We'll just think of something else later on that's a bit more imaginative. And 11 years later, it's still called the Corporate Ag Group. Um, formed with six members, uh, currently at 12. We, we have about, between, within the group, there's about uh, $5 billion worth of assets under management, farms, all farms. Um, we have a rule, it can only be CEOs or chairs that can attend, so we, we make sure we don't um, end up delegating it down to, to um, general managers. Um, we took out NFF membership. We were the first corporate group outside the peak councils of cattle council or state bodies or not that PGA has ever joined, um, but when WAF would, would join, he, uh, we'd, sit, we'd sit around the table. We were up there with New South Wales farmers. In fact, we paid the same fees. Uh, we actually paid more fees uh, with the corporate agro. At that time, we were on $48,000 a year than WAF, who were paying $40,000 to be members of um, the NFF. But what it did was it gave us, it gave us the ability to have input onto policy. And, and my view of this is you can sit on the side and say, we don't like this, we don't like that, that's wrong, that's bad. If you don't like it, get in and fix it. Do something about it. I, I, I despise people who sit on the side and quip and moan and groan, but actually don't do anything about it. If you've got an issue, do something about it. So this is the way that we sort of getting into that. Um, we started a workplace health and safety group. Um, and I've got to explain the culture of the corporate ag. All 12 of us, there is a, a drop box in there, so anything you want to learn or know, if you want a, a, a um, standard operating procedure for a, I won't say nine inch angle grinder, because they've all gone, um, you know, for an angle grinder or a tractor or a backhoe, it'll, it'll be there. Um, so there's no competitive advantage, it's all shared, so the industry grows within that sector. We also then um, benchmark against each other, and the first part of that was actually getting in there and defining the terminology so we could compare apples with apples and make sure that we do. That group continues to, uh, to, to be there and continues to grow, and I think it's one of the reasons that why corporate agriculture leads the OHS issues at the moment. You, know, you wouldn't find a better system than Hassad, and, and probably most of the corporate ag group would be the same. We're just looking at something in the um, OHS, in the HR space as well. Uh, one of the other directorships that I didn't mention there before was um, um, was uh, Harvey Beef. I'd been on the when I was at Elders, I was on the board of Harvey Beef. Again, kept in touch with the uh, the chairman John Nichols for for some time. John was looking to sell it. Um, he asked me to come back, um, and I was between roles and as an interim CEO at Harvey Beef. Um, it was a it was a great role. Four months. Um, I was doing the fly in, fly out from home. Uh, it was it, it was interim. Um, we were preparing it for sale and then um, Twiggy Forest came along. Actually, Craig Moyston Group were in there for a long time, which is fairly well known, uh, but Twiggy came along and just, how much do you want? Here's the cheque. And uh, the deal was done fairly quickly. Um, so again, you know, interesting space to be in. Um, and, and part of that is, and I'll talk about it a bit later on, is, is the value of networking. And then my current role, 2015, um, I was offered the job of Hassad Australia. Um, it's, it's a fully owned subsidiary of Qatar Investment Authority. Um, uh, part of the negotiation was that I would maintain my board roles, which they were happy with. Well, they weren't happy with, they accepted. Um, and, uh, and so I'd started with Marcus Olden, kept up Dairy Australia, and, um, and started with, with Hassad. Hassad owned 17 properties across Australia. We're running about 150,000 ewes. Unfortunately, about 50,000 of them were Awasis, and I'll talk about them a bit later on. Uh, we crop about 75,000 hectares a year of, of winter crop. Um, a little tiny bit of cotton, but hardly worth mentioning. Uh, in in uh, Western Australia, we have a farm up at uh, Bindi Bindi, which, where I was yesterday, um, Jerramungup and, um, and Condonup. Uh, so we, all we have over here is cropping only, no, no fences, not a trough. If there is, they should have been pulled out. Uh, <laughs> the investment commences food security. Qatar said, well, we need to secure 100,000 tonnes of feed wheat, 100,000 tonnes of feed barley, and 100,000 of these Awasi ram lambs a year. It was driven by passion. You, you don't need to own farms to, uh, to have food security. It, it was so ridiculous at some point that they uh, weren't allowing rotation crops to be grown. So wheat on barley on wheat on barley, and so no canola because we don't want canola. 
And, uh, and again, this is before my time, so I didn't have to have these battles, luckily. Um, but there were people in management who said, if we aren't able to grow rotation crops, we're out. Um, you know, because it's, it's damaging to our reputation personally that we are going to look like idiots in this, um, as people looking over there, as, as we start yielding one tonne to the hectare of our cereals. And, um, so luckily that changed. Um, so the uh, introduction of came in, and then cropping became very commercial. Um, but the Awasis were there. I'll talk about the Awasis a bit later on, but you know, basically they're a fat tail sheep that culturally they love. Put in context, uh, I'll give the background to it. Qatar's had money for about 30 or 40 years. Um, before that, they roamed the desert. You know, they were, they were a Bedouins. Um, and a Bedouin would typically have 40, 50 of these Awasi sheep and they milked them and, and they used the, the hair that comes off them, 40 micron medulated fibre, and that provides their matting. Uh, and then eventually they kill them and that's their meat. Um, so fast forward 40 years where they're now in Range Rovers and Jets, they still want that earthiness and they, they saw the Awasis as part of their culture and they wanted the Awasis. The trouble is that they'd never been, really been produced in Australia. There was um, YYH at Yathru had, had the only other flock um, and that was because they were exporting them and again probably more a passion there than anything else. Um, so for us, in order to achieve a comparable return for a crossbred or a composite um, enterprise, we would need $350 US for every lamb we sent over. At 70% lambing rates, uh, which is what we'd get, um, you, can't re you can't sell any young ewes. Everything has to go back in to maintain the flock structure. So all you're selling is cast for age ewes or Awasi ram lambs. So if you, the only ones that are going to go on a boat are the Awasi ram lambs. $350 US landed in Qatar. We needed a premium of about 20 to 25% above the local market. Of course, they looked at it and said, they're not local, we're going to discount it. We'll only buy them if you discount them 25%. So we're in this... We're in this stage where this, this investment had been made, they want it to work, but, the, but they would impose these, these uneconomic um, imposts on us, such as the Awasis. Um, this is after they had overcome the one of no, no, uh, no rotations. So, unfortunately, after several years of <laughs> relocating offices, shedding off five properties, um, the Qatar Investment Authority have decided to sell. So, I'm in number four, divestment. Um, so, uh, well, five of you count Harvey Beef, but I don't really say I, I didn't really. I was only there. I was only there for that particular purpose. So, um, uh, so next week we'll announce. Uh, no, journos here. That um, that we will sell 100%. <laughs> don't print it. You can print it next week. It'll be public. Uh, so I've been on the phone all afternoon and, and for the last month. Uh, we'll we'll sign up uh, next week. So um, that'll be a 400 million dollar transaction. Um, and uh, so where's this leave my career? Um, everyone's going, who cares? Um, <laughs> I do. My wife does. Well, maybe not too much. Uh, the truth is, I don't know at this point. Um, but, but I guess I've been I was probably surprised and, and humbled by the number of people who approached me to take on advisory uh, capacity or board roles um, when Assad finishes. Nothing's tangible. Um, but but I, the reason I wanted to share this good, the bad and the ugly with you is is uh, I've really enjoyed what I've done. You know, and I think corporate ag is a really good career to pursue. I mean, I grew up on an 1,800 hectare farm in western New South Wales, and, and uh, suddenly I've seen things and I've dealt with things that I never ever thought were possible that I would ever do in my lifetime. Um, but, you know, of course, over that time, I, I have developed some rules around what I would do in a career. Um, and I think these are things you have to do. You have to continuously upgrade your study. Um, and your qualifications. Uh, and I'm still doing that. You know, I did the uh, company director's course a couple of years ago. Um, I'll probably go off and do another um, formal studies in the next couple of years. I, I think you've got to do it and you've got to be in that competitive space to do it. It's unrealistic to think that you're going to climb that corporate ladder or if you're going back to your own farm that you're going to, everything you learn at Muresk is all you're ever going to need to learn. You're going to need to learn. Most of the things you learn here will be redundant in five years time. You've got to continuously learn, whether it's in formal education or informal education. Don't leave here thinking, God, I can't believe what that McKillop said. He thinks I've got to keep studying. Well, I'm gone. Oh, that's it. Um, second rule for me is do a good job wherever you are. You know, and I've seen plenty of people, unfortunately, burn a career, burn a reputation in their dying days of their, you know, they've had enough, they've got the shits, they want to move on, and all of a sudden they're not working, they're not turning up for work, they're doing a slack job, and people remember it. And the one thing about this industry, it is incredibly small. 
you know, if you don't know someone, someone will know someone who knows you. Um, so you can't hide for too long behind that. Don't slacken off. Do, the, do a good job wherever you go. And the third one, I've mentioned a couple of times, if you think just getting your qualifications and doing a good job is enough, it's not. You've got to network. You've got to establish those networks. You've got to use those networks. Um, again, you know, I, I kept in John Nichols, in touch with John Nichols from Harvey Beef because I liked the guy and we, and we got on well. You know, but he also, because of that, he offered me a job as an interim role. You know, these sort of things are very important to network. The KPMG role is because I deliberately went and met these guys at, a, um, at the ABARES conference. I think you've got to do that. And even again, going back to your own family farm, you've got to establish those networks because you want to be able to pick up the phone and say, I've got a problem here, what do you think? You can't do these things in isolation. The industry's, um, the industry's uh, too isolational to do that. As in, you might go back to your family farm, you might have one or two staff, but you want a network of hundreds of people that you can call upon and uh, talk to about different issues. Um, fourth rule for me is learn what you're good at. Um, for, for me, I, I'm not a technician, I'm not an agronomist, so I can go and look at a crop and think it looks good and you know, I can count tillers, and, but I, I'm not a technician. I, th I think what I'm good at is, is I, uh, I'm good at building teams and I'm good at building culture within a team. Um, I won't tolerate heroes, um, I won't tolerate um, people who want to be um, stand out from the crowd. Um, and for better or worse, I'm, I'm actually pretty good at restructuring and selling large-scale assets in case you hadn't got that, that hint as well. Um, I think I've topped over, oh, well, by the time we do this one, I'll be close to $1.5 billion in asset sales. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't on commission for any of it. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, but, um, but, you know, it, it does actually seem to be a, a skill set that's, um, that's needed and, um, and I'm quite happy to, to continue in that, in that space. Um, I think the fifth one for me is back yourself and take advantage of opportunities. You know, if something comes up, don't be afraid. Don't sit in a job that you're not really enjoying or you can't see where it's going just because you're too afraid to take a leap. Take a leap, back yourself. Chew, you know, what they say, bite off more than you can chew and chew like hell. And that's a bit like careers. You know, go in there, give it a go. I don't think I've ever gone into a role thinking, I don't know how I'm going to add value into this, you know. And then you get in there and think, Actually, there's a fair bit of value I can add in here, and, and I'll work really hard, and I'll and I'll um, and I'll have a go at it. Um, yeah, but having said all that, I, you know, I've lived in seven different cities or locations. You know, Wagga, Dubbo, Brisbane, Adelaide, Sydney, um, and that's hard on family. Um, I don't know where my kids would say home is for them. You know, we live in Barwon Head, south on the south coast of Victoria at the moment. We've been there six years. That's probably as close. That's the longest stint we've ever had. So. So, you know, I've had, a, uh, I've had an interesting career, but it has come at a price. Um, and that is, you know, we don't really have roots down anywhere. Um, but life's full of compromises and, and you have to decide what you're prepared to sacrifice in your career. Again, whether it's back on the family farm or you're going off into corporate career, what are you prepared to give up? Because there's no such thing as a free lunch. Okay, that brings me to the, the main topic. I should have stuck to the topic, shouldn't I, Christine? But anyway. Um, Hey, main topic of the evening is uh, what are the critical success factors for corporate investment in agriculture and why is R&D and innovation so important? Uh, first thing I think it's important to define what corporate ag is and so just quick diagram there I'd say you yeah, know there's farm businesses and oh, there's about 85,000 I'll put a slide up on that a bit later on you divide those into corporate the corporate I define as greater than five million dollar turnover um, commercial and then they're semi-commercial. I did actually originally used to call that unviable, but I used to get booed out. <laughs> so the, I'd say the unviable, and, and so the commercial is between uh, one and five million, and then the, the rent one is actually less than half a million turnover. Um, and you think, half a million turnover is still pretty good. 65% of your costs will be variable, uh, direct costs. Uh, about another 10 to 15% will be overheads, um, which and, and, and then you're going to need another 10% for drawings and interest, there's nothing left. You know, at 500 million turnover, there's just nothing left to do anything else with. Um, so it's only once you start to get to a million or above that you really start to have enough scale to actually do all those things and meet all those costs. So you can boo me down and tell me I'm wrong and, and uh, appreciate it. How that, how that bottom sector works is largely with off-farm income. And that's fine. You know, I, I'm okay with that. I, I don't have an issue with that. But but we need to understand that that is, that is a, a smaller end. And I'll get, again, I'll give the numbers on that. So within the corporate space, we have really two, two types of investors, domestic and foreign. Um, and within the domestic, obviously, we have the family operators and then we have the institutional and then the foreign. So it's really only, the, I'm only, in today's talk, we're only really referring to the foreign and the, 
and the institutional investors. Um, so it feels like the big are getting bigger and the small are becoming less relevant. Um, absolutely right. So um, current numbers that those that turn over less than $500,000 a year, um, there are 63,000 farms, 63 out of 85,000 businesses. Uh, that is 74% of farms. 74% of farms turn over less than half a million and are responsible for 22% of the agricultural output by value. So these are just raw numbers. In that middle space, um, half a million to a million, there's, there's 12,000 of them, 14% of the group putting out 17%. So they're about on par, you know, so there's about 14% of farmers doing about 17% of output. You know, that's, that's about consistent. They're about on the average, as you'd expect. Fast forward to those turning over more than 5 million, there's less, there's just on 900 of them. This is two years old now, this is 16 numbers, ABARES numbers. Uh, representing 1% of farmers, farm business units, now responsible for 23% of the output. Um, that number, I'll put it up on a slide, I'll explain it later on, that's just simply looking at the numbers and where each of those categories fall. You'll see the big decline, 152,000 farmers in 2006 when these numbers started, now 85,000. The biggest growth is in the next sector, I'll get onto that again. Um, 153 to 85 businesses with a turnover have increased, of between uh, 1 and 5 have increased by 74%, but those with an increase of a turnover of more than 5 million have increased by 140%. The biggest growth sector is this under uh, over 5 million sector. Look, partly that is just commodity prices, hence people go up into that bracket, but largely it's because of scale and consolidation within the industry. Um, so at the same time that we've had um, that big decline in, in numbers, 42% drop in the number of farmers, we've actually increased the value of agricultural output by 70%, sorry, by 27%. So we've dropped by 45% in numbers, but we've increased um, output by by 27%. Okay, this is just looking at those numbers. In 2006, there were 378 farmers that turned over more than 5 million, quarter of the old farms. Then it went to 500, 579, five years later, five years later again, 800. But what's interesting is what, what are their outputs? They went from 11%, 16%, now 23%. Um, are all of that five million plus turnover space. Um, and that trend's unlikely to change for the foreseeable future. Um, what sectors are they in? Um, they're pretty much everywhere. You know, like it's in horticulture, as you'd expect, you've got some bigger players than that. Uh, it's in cotton, you know, certainly Cubby Station, you know, is huge and cotton growers tend to do things on a scale. But then grains in there, beef and sheep, pigs and poultry, there's really no of the major um, commodities are excluded. So it's not like, um, it's not, it doesn't all belong to one sector. It's pretty much across the board where those large scale producers are, um, uh, are getting larger and larger. Uh, what is interesting, so I'll just go back to that, what is interesting is that 60% of those are actually family corporates. Um, and you'll hear that term a little bit. The family corporate is the large scale family operator. Many of them have external boards, many of them will have uh, outside capital, but they are largely family operators and they are turning over more than five million. And <laughs> I don't know if you're going to put Nico in that, but you know, you're going to have guys, <laughs> what's your turnover, it depends I suppose what year it is, but you know, you've got those sort of guys, uh, you know, and, and in the East Coast, there's a number of those families that any of, us, any of us could name that were turning over that $5 million plus sort of category. Um, there are unknown foreign investors in that. Um, and something I just want to explain too. Um, so a number of years ago we had, um, when I was on the NFF Members Council, because um, for my sins of chairing the Corporate A Group, I was put on the N NFF Members Council, and there was this all uprising about, you know, we want to know what foreign investors are doing in Australian agriculture and how big are they. So the policy came along, okay, we need to have a register of agriculture uh, investments. Yep, good, fine. Uh, of course, what actually happened was, the only way they did it was, um, you have to buy agricultural land, you have to register with a tax office that you're a foreign investor, goes on the asset registry. But all those registry tells you is how big it is. So, so Hassad, for example, with at the time, the peak was $550 million worth of assets, but only 300,000 hectares. 
we, we were never on the radar. Um, you go and buy a horse paddock up in the Northern Territory and, you, you know, a couple of million acres, you, hectares, you're probably likely to get on that, on that um, registry because it's all about hectares. So if you looked at numbers at the moment, 13.6 is um, of foreign investment in Australian agriculture is owned by uh, the UK. That really comes down to um, Joe Lewis, who owns 40% of AACO, which is considered foreign, Australian ASX company, but it's a foreign company. Uh, and then Terra Firma, which is a cattle company owned by, um, owned by Terra Firma, consolidated pastoral company, um, again, up for sale at the moment. And then the Chinese just hit the registry last year. Why? Because they bought the share of Kidman. Suddenly that goes up and Kidman's a lot of country, not always a lot of value, but a lot of country in it. Um, so it really doesn't tell you much. It tells you how, what area people have, but it doesn't really tell you the value of pe what people have. Um, and the reason we take foreign investors and we take it and we'll welcome it is because we can't get the Australian super funds to invest in, in agriculture. Yeah, to a very limited extent will they do it. So some of the rules that came in a couple of years ago, and this is where the NFF debate went, um, they talked about the re reduction of the threshold from 252 million down to 15 million. It sort of is right and it sort of isn't right. It's, it's a cumulative 15 million. So once a foreign investor has more than $15 million in agriculture, every cent thereafter has to go up to Foreign Investment Review Board. Um, that includes leases. So we leased an office last year in Melbourne, five-year option, five-year lease with a five-year option, had to go through FERB. Um, we had someone engage a, uh, we, we engaged a consultant to help us find that office space. He charged $8,000 to find and negotiate our lease for us. Uh, FERB charges $10,000 to approve it. Um, I don't know what we were going to do. Anyway, I don't know what they thought we could have possibly done with that office space, but um, I, I think the FERB rules, I understand why they're there. I understand that, that the public wants them, but I think they've gone too far and they're, too, uh, they're sending a message out there that we don't welcome foreign investment in Australian agriculture. Um, and the last one that's came in, came in a couple of, year, a couple of uh, months ago, or, or probably a year ago now, um, is that you, any, any seller, this is the ridiculous part of it, if you are selling land to a foreign investor, um, the buyer who's foreign has to demonstrate that you as the vendor have advertised that widely for 30 days or more. Um, so you have to put that onus back on to the, to the seller to, the, to the seller to demonstrate why they should be able to sell to you. Um, it, it's a, uh, and so what it does is it cr creates this nonsense where people go out for an advertising campaign of two or three papers and, and, uh, and don't really show anyone around just to get through this this process and make it appear that anyone could buy this farm. Yeah, you know, we're going through that at the moment. Um, look, we'd welcome anyone with $400 million to step up and buy these farms, but the fact is we're not selling them individually, we're selling them as a whole, but, it, but we're gonna have to go through this process. Um, so, uh, which means that as a, a, a foreign investor really can't operate at auction because you, you've got a, you can't get pre-approval, or you can, but it's very hard to get it. Um, so you actually can't operate. So if you're selling to a foreign investor, uh, if you're selling your farm and you think foreign investors might be in there, you're not going to go to auction because of that process. Okay, so again, I'll go back to the NFF. We're having this debate. Foreign investment's good. Everyone in the room, the, the uh, president, the deputy, they're all saying it's really good. Uh, a couple of WAF people, Mike Norton. Um, did, I say, did I mention his name? Um, Mike was a bit more you know, hesitant about it. That's, that's Mike's prerogative. Um, but you know, one of the ones you, you would think wouldn't support it. Northern Territory, Rowan Sullivan, said foreign investment has always been part of the Northern Territory. They come and they go and generally they leave things in better condition when they arrive. And I think that's the way we've got to look at foreign investment in Australian agriculture. They can't take it with them. We sell them mines. We're quite happy to sell them mines. They dig it up, they take all the coal, they take all the iron ore and leave a hole there. In a farm, you can't take it with you. Um, you know, and generally you're not wanting it for food security. Qatar was the exception, but they sort of came to their senses pretty quickly. Um, and they put money into it. And I'm going to give an example now um, of uh, Tilopia Downs. Um, case study, because Tilopia Downs is, uh, is Victoria's largest property. Uh, 47,000 hectares, it sounds like, a, again, a hobby farm here, but 47,000 hectares in Victoria. Um, when we acquired it, it was 10 properties. There were five people living on those 10 properties altogether. The rest just came in, did their work, and went out again. Um, today, there's 19 staff. Actually, it's put a little bit under that um, now. It's about 15 staff. There's 36 people living on that farm. Um, went out there on Sunday um, for a barbecue. 
there's kids everywhere. The school bus is in, you know, doubled in size. Um, the local community is vibrant again. Uh, that property has gone from probably running 20,000, 25,000 sheep amongst all those properties. Last year we marked 48,000 lambs on it and we produced 16,000 tonnes of, of um, grain and oil seeds. You know, it, it, and that's what foreign investment has done for that region. Um, now, whether it was economical for the Qataris, that's another issue. I can tell you right now, it wasn't. You know, they will not make a cent. In fact, they've lost money out of that. But is that, is that should government policy be concerned about that? I don't think it should be. Government policy should be saying, what is that foreign capital doing for Australia? And I think we need to encourage it because I think there's lots of these sort of stories out there um, where foreign capitals come in, it's done a good job and it goes again. Um, Hassad's story. Um, again, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, it was established purely as a food security play. They started breeding these dam um, <laughs> They extended the strategy in 2012 into grain in South Australia, Western Australia. Um, I think we're probably one of the early corporates to come over here. Um, now you've got uh, Warwick Harry well and truly here, Lawson Grains well and truly here, Daybreak about to come back with a vengeance. Uh, obviously uh, Westchester been here probably a bit before us on a lease and sale, sale, um, lease and sale model. Um, but I think yeah, we were probably one of the early corporates to come in and, uh, and of any scale into that space. Um, that's changed over the last couple of years where now we are just purely a, a return on asset investment and we are the odd one out. So the Qatar Investment Authority owns 30% of VW, it owns 40% of Core Hotels, it owns 30% of Glencore. The theme is they don't operate, um, they just invest, they're passive investors. So that's, about what we, that's what we're about to go back through now. They want to go back to that model where they don't want to own and operate, they don't want the headache. Um, that would involve work and it's just not an anathema to them that you'd have to work. Not recording this, are you? Uh, here's what an Awasi looks like. Uh, fat tail breed, 40 micron hair, it's 100% medulated. Uh, we, we sent one wall off, admittedly it was, um, it was uh, crutchings, we got a bill for it. <laughs> okay, don't do that again. Um, Last lot we sold, this is the peak of the market, we sold, we got uh, 60 cents a kilo for it. Um, we actually compete with recycled Pepsi bottles and Coke bottles. Um, that's the market we're in, is that um, shredded uh, uh, matting. Uh, I said 300, I think it's about 350 actually. 75% land marking on a really good year. It's all about passion, not about economics. Um, but the enterprise at the moment, as it is today, we have 152,000 hectares, 65,000, it's actually 75,000 hectares of crop. Um, we generate about 60,000 um, in sales, so we're well and truly in that top group. We're one of the 900. Uh, about 90 on-farm staff, uh, offices in Dubbo and uh, Melbourne. We had a meat marketing department, uh, 90 million in sales from that. Uh, customers in the Middle East and Asia. Again, developed through these connections because of foreign investment. We're actually going back and using those connections to to sell meat into those. Um, and we just started a grain trading division, which won't proceed now because of um, the staff, but we just started on that two and a half staff we'd employed, um, but we're obviously winding that up now. So, um, so where, where are the Qataris, what, what's been their issue? They started out with passion, not economics. So they wanted to run a Wassies. Um, returns were poor. Um, they don't like Volatility. They're used to having diversified earnings that don't, that don't have this volatility that we have in agriculture. And food security doesn't require ownership of farms in Australia. And that's what it comes down. So you might recall um, 18 months ago, they were cut off almost overnight from, yeah, they're all these spits in the Middle East. Um, so Qatar, sorry, uh, UAE, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Bahrain to a lesser extent, uh, Saudi and Egypt cut them off. 70% of their food came from those countries. Overnight, no, 70% of their food was gone. What do you do? You got money. Yeah, so they went, to, uh, they went to Turkey, they went to Amman, they went to these other countries that were friendlies and they, they bought food. You know, they, they, three days later the shelves are full again in Qatar, in Doha. So, you, you know, we didn't actually supply them anything. You know, we didn't have wheat ready to go. If we did, they didn't want wheat, they wanted flour. So we, you know, we had meat, but, you know, it was going to take two weeks to get this. So it's, so it didn't. It dawned on that they don't need to own farms to be in to be in this space. Um, so um, so why why be in agriculture at all? You know, um, and so what's the appeal to corporates? And really, 
partly it's operating returns, but you know that's incredibly volatile and not always there and hard to achieve. Capital gains, you know, is is it's steady, it's stable. Uh, these are the numbers out of the Heron Todd White Grazing Index. So what are they? 30, uh, 24 years, uh, 34 years. Sorry, um, average over 39 over that 20, 34 years is 4.7 percent compound annual growth rates, so compounding on top of each other each year. That's pretty attractive. If you can do four or five percent operating return, you know, if you're up there, you'll get four or five percent, and you get four or five percent capital gain on top of that. You're at eight to ten percent return on investment. Um, that's reasonably attractive. You know, they, they look at equities and say we want more than that, but reality is there's, there's only so many equities you can buy, there's only so many CBD properties you can buy, there's only so many, you've got to have alternative investments and agriculture is quite a stable, I call it capital stable, um, income volatile investment to be in. You don't wake up as, as they did. So a, a classic example, um, the results of VW's um, emissions testing scam came out where they cheated on the emissions. They lost $6 billion in that investment overnight. Uh, now, you're not going to wake up and find out that agriculture has suddenly been replaced by a pill or by something else. You know, so, so the value of agricultural land is actually quite steady and quite stable compared to equities that they're involved in elsewhere. So that's the appeal of, of uh, agriculture over many other alternative investments that are there. OK. So the challenges for corporate ag. Um, you know, most family farmers will operate with direct costs, overheads, interest, whatever, and then we add on to that corporate costs. Uh, I'm not proud of it, but I can say that our corporate costs run at about $4 million a year. Um, that's not my salary. Um, that's because yeah, we have a board, uh, we have investors overseas, they want to us to run Oracle software, they want us to have account staff, they want us to have occupational health and safety, all that stuff, all happy with it, but it comes at a cost, and it comes at a cost that you as family operators don't necessarily have to face. So that's our big disadvantage. So then the interest, the challenge then is to how do we create more from our access to capital in our scale than we destroy through our overheads. And, and so we, we've taken the view uh, that precision ag is probably where we really need to be at the forefront. We've got the scale to do it. <coughs> so we have a, um, a, a three, four way relationship, PCT, John Deere, um, Incitec Pivot were in there, they've sort of dropped out a little bit on it, um, and ourselves, um, where we are doing a whole lot of stuff in the, sorry about the quality of these slides, I couldn't quite get them to work. Um, so we've gone and over all of our 75,000 hectares of crop now, we have, and we're doing it on the grazing stuff as well, we've done EM38 surveys, we've done full radiometrics, um, we've done, everything now is building up over layers and layers of yield data, um, going now into the quality of those yields in terms of um, uh, protein levels on each of them. Um, so we're building up this picture of, of what our farms look like. This is a South Australian one. Uh, average yield 1.57 tonnes to the hectare, not a great year. But a, you know, a variation of 63% uh, coefficient of variation. Huge. You can see the red. Red's bad. Green's good. Um, uh, there's a fair bit of red in there. Um, so the question is why? You know, we've gone from 4.6 tonnes to the hectare in one section down to um, half a tonne to the hectare in another session. section. Why? You know, so, so we know that bit of data, we know that yield data, but that doesn't really tell us why. We use the EM38, so, so for those who aren't technical like me, EM38 basically measures your water holding capacity in a soil. Uh, but we want to know more. We want to know what's underneath that. What, why aren't we, aren't we able to utilise that wa water there? Um, so then we went into converting that to gross margins. So if we know that we're making um, $721 a hectare in one section and we're making negative 52 on the other, how do we increase the, the gross margin on that $52 a hectare? And that could be simple as not spending the money on it. We don't see it as saving ourselves fertiliser or saving ourselves, saving, our, saving ourselves ripping or anything else. It's about saying, if we're under fertilising here, well, let's take some of the fertiliser here and put it over there because we're never going to get four tonnes to the hectare here, but we might be able to get six tonnes over here. Um, and that's really what it's about, been about for us, that whole journey. Um, so now that goes into variable rate, one of the trials we did last year, variable rate trial on lime. So um, you can see those strips that we have in there. Um, we've, we've put those, in those strips there, we're putting different rates of, of lime. Um, four and a half, what, two and a half, one and a half, zero, zero is the control areas. 
and then we're going back and measuring those because we know, now know what the soil type is, we know the pH of all of that paddock, so we've done, so we've done pH and everything as well. Uh, we're now able to measure all that um, and gain that sort of information that gives us those different layers. Um, I was out at uh, this tilapia downs on uh, Monday, Western Victoria, and uh, so we're just trialling this, um, and unfortunately we're about to sell it, <laughs> but uh, we know that um, down here in the gully, it's frost. Then we know up here, it actually we get reasonably good yields because uh, it doesn't frost. So we're actually sowing uh, one variety down here and as it goes up at a certain point, we have two seed carts, it cuts over to the other seed cart and we sow a different variety as we go up. Um, tilopia, we're taking it to another extent. Uh, we've actually sown, because um, country varies there from sand to a bit of clay, we've actually sown um, field peas on the clay and we've sown lupins um, on the sand. So you can see the whole paddock is just um, it changes every 100 metres between different, different crops and that's all been mapped out as a result of all this. You say that's going to be a nightmare to harvest. It will be, but we're only keeping it for stock feed so it doesn't really matter. But that's the sort of thing that variable rate technology and building up these layers and layers of data can start to do for you going forward. And I think that's where corporate ag can add advantage and we're happy to do it and we're happy to have trials. Most of our properties will have trial work done on them and, and they are open up. The one at Canoundra. Western New South Wales has an annual field day there with about 150 people on it. It's really good for us. You know, we get a real buzz out of seeing people coming and checking and, and people were negative about Hassad coming in saying, oh, these, you know, Arabs are coming in and what they're going to do. And, you know, but now they come in and say, that's great. What you guys are doing is great. You know, you're really pushing the envelope and I think that's what we bring to it is we, that ability to take a bit of risk in there. We can take a risk on 5,000 hectares out of 75,000 hectares. It's not going to break us. Um, you know, as a, as a smaller family operator, you, it's hard to get that critical mass to do all that. Okay, so do's and don'ts of investment in agriculture. Most importantly is have a, pa is have a, have a, have a strategy based on reality, not passion. That's where Hassad's, you know, it hasn't worked for them because they started out with the wrong reasons. Important that you engage the community. You know, people are concerned about foreign investment coming in. You want to make sure, and things like field days and buying locally and all that stuff really helps with all that. The main thing I'd say to any investor coming in is it's 10 years minimum. Um, yeah, my golden rule in agriculture is 80% of your profit will be made in three out of 10 years. And I'll say that again, 80% of your profit will be made in three out of 10 years. The other seven years, making the other 20%, breaking even and hopefully not losing too much. So you've got to be in there for that long haul. You know, you, you can miss out on those three years if you're only a six or seven year fund. Um, you've got to have that longer term investment in there. Um, my don'ts, don't believe spreadsheets. You know, I, I, spreadsheet farming is really profitable. You know, I can make a killing out of it. It's just reality. Every time something goes wrong, you don't know what it is. And spreadsheets don't reflect it. Um, you know, it'll be a disease. It'll be a low wheat price. It's rare. I was up at Bindi Bindi yesterday, as I said, bragging, I can grow crops up there, you know, so we'll, if we have another rain, um, should do four tonnes. We had four tonnes in 2016, but 2016 was $170 a tonne. 2018 looks like it's going to be $320 a tonne or $310 a tonne on farm. At four tonnes, that's one of those three years. You know, we will absolutely kill it up there if we just get one more rainfall. It's actually wet, we're actually using aircraft up there to um, spread fertiliser yesterday. Um, you've got to be in it for the long haul. Um, don't underestimate the cost of aggregating um, and, and uh, up farms. So we you know, go up there, there's, there were six farms, there were six levels of ryegrass resistance, of radish resistance, um, different rotations, there were fences everywhere, there were small paddocks of 50 hectares and 80 hectares. It takes, it takes years and four or five years to get on top of all that. We've, we've spent a million dollars on lime up at that place, 6,700 hectares of cropping in the last five years. Um, you look at it this year and you think it's all it's all coming it's all coming together, um, but you've got to have that longer term view and you've got to be um, prepared to to spend that time and money on, on aggregating. Um, this is only applies to those who are in this space, but when you're setting up a fund, you have what you call asset managers and you have your fund managers. Your fund managers are your banker types. Um, they uh, they're financial engineers and they raise capital and stuff. The asset manager are the ones who actually get their hands dirty. Well, probably not me as, as much, but um, you know what I mean. But they, uh, it's very easy to have an asset manager who buys and then walks out, gets paid a nice premium, uh, gets paid a bonus for buying and buying quickly, and then walks out, and then someone else is left there to try and implement the spreadsheets that they made up. 
and it's a really hard, this, this is the third time I've done it where I've gone in and said, it's just not achievable. Yeah, you know, what you've been sold is simply not achievable. It's probably my downfall because I go in and say, this is what we can do, and they say, well, that sucks, so we'd rather get out. But for me, um, I would rather tell them the truth and, and uh, have that sold than, than sort of live the, live the lie of trying to say you can get 12%, 10% operating returns out of um, agriculture year on year. Um, OK, four rules. Spreadsheet farming, very profitable. Um, in broad acre, 50 per cent of your capital gain, 50 uh, percent of your returns of capital gain, 50 per cent operating returns. 80 per cent of the profit, as I said before, will be in three years. Um, and you need to diversify by geography and by commodity price. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about research and development. Obviously, been involved in um, MLA and Dairy Australia and a few others. I, I'd implore you, we have a fantastic model of R&D in Australia. Um, underwritten by statutory funding agreements with the federal government, where they will match dollar for dollar the capital that we raise. There's a constant threat to those, um, to that model. And I think if we have a change of government federally, there'll be another renewed push to look at that model. It is, I won't say it's completely unique to Australia, but it really is a model that, that if we lose it, we'll never get it back again. Um, but you can't sit here and think that MLA, Dairy Australia, and all those will be a lobby group. They're not lobbyists. You know, we don't do lobby. We do research, development, extension, and in some cases, marketing. Um, but people think, I pay a level, you, you need to go and march on Canberra. Don't look to those people to march on Canberra. Go and talk to WAF or PGA about that. Um, but if, you want to, if you, you've made an investment, you have to make an investment through your statutory levy funding. Um, so if you're going to do it, go and engage with these people. You know, there are a whole lot of really clever people in these organisations who do a lot of really good work and nothing is more frustrating for them than not having people come in the door and say, how can I engage with you? You know, how can I leverage your knowledge on my farm? This is what I want to do. You'll be inundated by people saying, right, OK, we've got this idea, we've got that idea. You know, it, it will happen. You've just got to find the right people in there. But it's not going to happen by osmosis. You're not going to develop this knowledge just simply by sitting there on your own farm. Um, total factor productivity, we've seen these, won't go on for too much longer. Um, it's declining. You know, we, we sit generally at around 2%. Uh, compound uh, total factor productivity. The last couple of years, um, dairy 1.5, last 15 is 1 per cent. Beef 1.3, last 15 is half per cent. Sheep, atrocious. Sheep's the other one, <laughs> you know. Um, the, the wool price reserve scheme did a lot, um, <laughs> a lot of hiding. Um, so historically it sat on 0.3 um, per cent total factor productivity. It's only in the last couple of years people said, shit, we better actually do something for ourselves. So it's actually improved a lot. Cropping's generally set around that one and a half, and lately it's actually been 2.1%. Um, so, you know, that's what drives agricultural investment is that every year, it's certainly not price, because price will go up and down. What you've got to do is take advantage of that. And that's the industry average. What you've got to do is actually double that total factor productivity on your own place. OK, so summary. Plan to be career ready. Um, you know, get your studies, network, get out there, do a good job. Um, Corporate agriculture is here to stay. It's growing. It's mainly family-based, 60%, but there's 40% that aren't, that aren't in that space. Um, we need to look at the rules around FERB and how foreign investment comes into that. Agriculture as an investment is not easy. Um, it's got to be a longer-term investment. And, uh, and if I'd give advice to anyone looking to set up a fund, don't believe the salesman, because spreadsheets will always low and so we always be wrong, and something will go wrong somewhere in the industry. Um, so um, for you guys leaving and for the students here, um, if you wander off into your post muresque life, um, I, I suppose for me I'm somewhat envious. Um, you know, I wish I was 25 again, one, you know, starting out because I, I just think there's a whole world of opportunities out there, and I think you guys will think differently to what my generation. We were very staid. You know, we didn't want to break the mould too much. We didn't want to do anything that was no one else had done. I, I think you guys are just. Um, so much more liberated in terms of, you're going to look at investment in agriculture as multifaceted. It's not going to be, I want to own a farm. I want to own a farm, I might own a feed mill, I might own four or five other different businesses. It's going to be this broader, ag true agribusinesses rather than just farming businesses. Um, I, think, um, I think you're going to be better connected. I don't mean just internet. I think you're actually going to be better connected within networks as well. I think you're, um, and I think you're going to be a lot more entrepreneurial than we were. I think you'll look at things a lot differently and I don't think you'll have this view of just saying the farm is all I need to do as long as I grow the farm, that's all that matters. 
I think there's, there's opportunities, but I think you're going to need to develop resilience around that. It's not easy. You know, there's going to be droughts, there's going to be fires, there's going to be floods. Um, mental illness today is a lot more on the radar than it ever has been, but, you know, I think those who can develop those networks, develop those skills and develop that resilience, I think have a great future in agriculture. Um, I, I live in a very beautiful part of the world, Barwon Heads, as I mentioned, on the surf coast of Victoria. Um, but obviously growing up in western New South Wales, I, I was probably a bit late to take up surfing, although I did use a freeboard on the irrigation channel behind a, a ute. Um, channel was about that wide, it was pretty precarious. Um, but one day I was down there uh, watching on the surf, I was watching pretty big waves and, uh, and I knew a guy out there and, and I saw him coming off and um, couldn't see him for what seemed a couple of minutes. And uh, eventually came back up and off he went. And when he came in half an hour later, I said, I said, what happened out there? He said, oh, you know, I just got caught off guard. Wasn't prepared. Um, something happened and this big wave just dumped me. And, um, and I was pinned to the bottom of the ocean. I was down on the sand and the rock. My back was aching. My lungs were busting. I, I thought I was going to die. And, uh, but then eventually the wave lifted, the water, you know, took the pressure off him. He rose to the surface. He took a big breath. His lungs filled with air again. And I said, what'd you do then? He said, I went straight back out again. I said, why? He said, because that's what I love doing. And I think that's in agriculture. You know, you're going to have good times, you're going to have bad times, but it's tough. But you love what you do, and I think you've all got a great future. So um, thank you very much for indulging me on uh, my passion of talking about um, ag and, uh, and everything pertains a little bit about my, my career, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I hope you got something out of it, and I look forward to having, um, uh, catching up with you all later on. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. McKillop. I will now call on Head of School of Business, Professor Christine Storer, to facilitate the question and answer session. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much, John, for a very inspiring and, and broad lecture. Um, so I'd like to open the floor for questions. So if you could have a nice, clear voice when you've got your questions, and please keep it to a short, sharp question or topic, and we'll see what John can give us in his words of wisdom. Right at the back there, thanks, John Hassel and then Jane. Yeah, thanks, Christine. John Hassel, I'm a past student, probably done a couple of the things that you've talked about since uh, since leaving. And, and uh, interesting, you're talking about Cox Inall, because the CEO of that is one of the students from my cohort here, uh, Tim Powell. Tim Powell, yeah, okay. Good guy, he was a student at New York. I didn't realise that. Yeah, yeah right. so the question I would like to ask you is about uh, superannuation funds. Why can't we get superannuation funds uh, investing in agriculture, and should we be mandating? superannuation funds to invest in uh, Australian business? Yep. Um, answer, answer the first part of that question uh, first. Um, I have a super fund. Um, I don't want someone telling me where, where that money has to be invested. So I'd say no to that one. We, we don't, we just can't mandate that certain investments have to be made. Um, the, the, the issue of why they don't, uh, the good and the bad system about, thing about Australian uh, superannuation is that it's defined uh, contribution. So I own, my, I own my super fund. That amount that goes in there um, is mine, and, and if I look at the performance of my fund manager and I don't like it, I can move tomorrow. A couple of clicks on the computer and I've gone from AMP to BT or wherever it happens to be. Very flexible. The downside of that is no one wants to stand out from the pack because they're not wanting to take an investment that is longer term. You know, because because they don't, we don't look at it longer term. We all look at our results every six months or at least once a, once a year and say, they've underperformed, I'm going elsewhere. Most of Europe and America have defined benefit. So when I retire, I get 50%, 75% of my salary at the time of retirement. I don't care what they do. They can go and invest in chook farms, they can go and invest in satellite dishes, I don't care. As long as they can meet their obligations to fund my retirement, don't care. And that's why we're seeing billions and billions and billions coming in from insurance funds, uh, longer term pension funds out of the US and Europe, um, and now sovereign wealth funds because it's part of a diversification. Um, how do we get around it? it it's, a, uh, it's a difficult one because uh, they don't want to stand that from the pack. And I've had lots of conversations with Australian super funds and all they want to talk about is the negatives. They want to talk about Great Southerns and Timber Corps and go, well, you can't judge investment in Australian agriculture by those. Thanks, John. Um, 
Thanks, John. Um, James is next, and perhaps I'm hoping a student's got a question, so get your thinking caps on. Thanks, James. Um, my question was the same, so I'll pick another one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Think on your feet. You, you, uh, you mentioned about the ability to, to invest large amounts, you know, in corporate agriculture. Um, I guess the other side of the equation can be wasting a lot of money. Do, do, do you see there's a, a problem that that can be a possible one? Yeah, I, I think um, I talked about it before. You know, when, when they're driven by when there's uh, anomalies in the system, and I'll call that kindly about what Great Southern Timber Corp was. When there's a tax-driven scheme in there, p people will fill that void, and with bad ideas. You know, uh, I mean, you're far closer to that in Western Australia, critically the Great Southern one. You know, it was just driven by this desire for tax benefits. Yeah, and so I think that was just complete waste of taxpayers and personal money. Uh, greed set in. Greed set in by the promoters of it. These people weren't really interested in, in getting returns, they were just getting interested in getting money in the door so they could spend it. And, and we all saw examples where, you know, trees had to be sown by the 30th of June to get the tax deduction, so they just went out into a country that should never have grown trees. They had the, you know, they had the, the, the cattle scam or scheme, as they called it, you know, and again, the same sort of thing, just going out and leasing country, um, so one of the things I had to do when I was at Elders, uh, Les Wozniska was saying, we should be getting into this space of um, promoting a cattle um, MIS, Managed Investment Scheme. And so I did the numbers and we went and spent six or eight months going around understanding it all. The actual, of every dollar that an investor put up, 23% um, went in marketing, business development and corporate overheads. You try and get a return out of agriculture with 23% already gone <laughs> before you get in there, uh, you can't do it. Um, so, it's, uh, so, so these things are purely driven by the lack, you know, but there was no economics in it other than the economics of the, um, of the actual promoter of them. Uh, so, but then, in, that's, that's MIS's. I think in mainstream corporate, I think, I think we're all getting better at it. And I think the investors are getting wise. Every now and again you come across one, you know, where, and they get sold a pup, and I think the Chinese have done a lot of that, where they they don't want to pay for due diligence. They will shop around. They'll get an opinion from me. Obviously, they move on because I tell them <laughs> the truth. Until they go and find somebody who tells them that they'll make 10 or 15%, then they invest with them. And then the next seven years, they're just trying to work out why they're not making those sort of returns. Um, so I, I, think, uh, I think there is a danger there that, that, that people uh, will scheme it and scam it. Um, but I think now there's a whole lot of... So it was within the corporate ag group... Um, yeah, all of those, all those people are now in their in their professional end of farm management, um, either own, operate, or, or lease it out. Um. Thank you, John. Uh, Shane Sander, um, farm management consultant. Uh, thanks very much for a very you know, interesting presentation. As the there's probably with some sadness, you probably watch another transition of a career. Did you? How did you go through the process? Of or did you go through the process at all of trying to convince the owners that there was another option or restructuring and, and alter, alternating their investment thesis about what they wanted to produce and how they went about that? Yeah, but certainly I've uh, spent the last pretty much two years trying to do that. Um, uh, and in the end, I thought we were getting somewhere. Um, you know, we looked at this diversification where um, we had developed this uh, meat marketing division. We're about to start the grain trading division. The grain trading division was going to focus on um, pulses, um, and then ultimately we saw that heading into the plant protein market again for the diversification. The lamb, uh, we had finally got rid of the awasis um, towards the end of last year. We had then done a joint research program with MLA to look at high marbling um, lambs um, and and looking at ways of retaining that value the whole way through so quickly step at the moment there's one issue around selling a lamb to a processor and that's price and weight you know weight set price is negotiable um, what we want to do was have that debate around eating quality and um, and intramuscular fat bigger larger retail um, muscle retail meat yields um, a lot of that work had been done and we'd line up all the people to do that but at the end of the day we, we had the wrong investors because they didn't want a model where they own and operate. They wanted a model of being minority interests in passive investors. So, um, yeah, probably one of the great laments of my life is that we weren't able to continue with that strategy and, uh, and execute it. Um, but it's not my money. Student question. Come on.
I do this at market still if it helps. <laughs> Nominate them, well done. Yes, well done. Um, Go Tom. Just wondering if you could expand a bit on foreign investment into ag. Um, like I can see that's often depicted as quite a negative thing, especially in the media. I was just wondering if you've got ideas of why that is and ways to combat it. I think um, uh, I once heard a CSIRO um, scientist say, um, to every complex question there is invariably a simple answer, um, which is invariably wrong. And, and I, think that's, I think that's the grab that we get from, particularly now with media, people read 160 words at the most. Um, so do you want Australian farms to be owned by Australians or foreigners? Australians. Yeah, okay, great. Move on to the next topic. Um, you know, so, so I don't think people really understand it. And if you look at where, those, where the angst about foreign investment comes from, it's actually in the cities. Um, and again, I've only seen one set of numbers in this, but it was actually saying the majority of people in, in rural regional areas support foreign investment. Um, the majority of city people don't. Why? Because they don't understand the concept of it. You know, they're okay for that office building that they go into every day to be owned by a foreign investor, but they don't want that farm over there. I think people still have this feeling that that their food is produced, you know, by, well, you know every animal on your farm and you lovingly slaughter it and you, you know, you nurture it and that's the food I'm going to bring to my farm, you know, onto my table at night. But if it's owned by a foreigner, well, it has to be factory farming and, you know, it can't have that same. But, you know, I think there's just a whole lot of misconception about what agriculture is. Um, and, and I don't think, um, you know, if you ask someone who doesn't understand the issues or their opinion, they're going to go to the simple answer and it's invariably wrong. It's, only, it's a regional town of 4,000 people. <laughs> so every day I seem to be having um, disagreements with people on Twitter and Facebook about the current state of agriculture, be it live trade or Roundup or caged eggs and all that. Um, it seems to really be a fervour out there with the vegans and that. They seem to poo-poo agriculture in a lot of ways and it has a big domino effect. Whereas where I live in a low socio-economic area type thing. People are really concerned about their meat prices and all that, but they don't care. We hear from our Minister of Agriculture saying the majority of Australians don't like live trade, the majority of Australians don't like uh, caged eggs, the majority of Australians don't like Roundup. You know, but when I go and talk to simple folk or people that are busy making a living, they don't care, but these minorities yeah. seem to really rule, and then it's having a big domino effect on perception of agriculture and kids wanting to study agriculture. So, you know, you yeah, but certainly the, um, uh, you know, it's, it's almost getting to the point of being uh, alarmingly trendy to be a vegan, um, you know, if not at least a vegetarian. Um, it's, it's not that. My point is those people are starting to make government policies. Yeah. And that's having a bigger thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to a large extent, you know, we, we, can, we can influence the debate. Um, and, and largely we, you know, so MLA and dairy, we, we I'm not an MLA now, it's still on dairy, we have a whole team of social media people um, and they tweet and they post and they do Facebook and they do all that to try and get their message out and they, they will go to influencers and they'll try and get that message across. Um, but, um, but we have to be constrained in what we do, you know, we can't tell lies. Um, but if I'm Joe Blow sitting in the street in, you know, in a trendy suburb in Melbourne, I can tell, say whatever I want, no one's going to hold me to account. Um, so you've sort of got one side where they can say anything, and you've got the other side that actually can only ever be honest and open. Um, so I think we lose it a bit on that, on that side. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, just outside the Dairy Australia office was a big placard saying, you know, go vegan, you know, <laughs> don't drink milk. Um, it's pretty hard to counter that um, to a large extent. But you're right, you know, ask most people what they care about and it's about what their grocery bill is. Um, but having, having said that, um, I've got a good friend in Brisbane who's the largest egg producer in Victoria. Um, they've responded, they don't have caged eggs anymore. And they've said, you know, we've put up and it's a dollar a dozen more or whatever the price difference is and the consumer has voted with their feet and they've said, we want free range eggs. He says, fine. You know, he, he will point out the irony of it, their death rates are actually double, I think it might be triple, I think, in the um, free range than they are in the cages. But you know, people, five times, is it? thank you, five times the death rate in the free range as it is in um, cages. But if the consumer feels good about buying it, then they, and they want willing to pay for it, we'll do anything you want. You know, if you want, you know, if you want purple wheat, we'll breed purple wheat, you just gotta pay for it. Um, and, and sometimes they will and sometimes they won't. One more last burning question, thanks, Kevin. Um, uh, Kevin Yeah. 
Um, so uh, we, we uh, have started to use um, the more sophisticated software at risk, um, where we're modelling in price volatility, we're modelling in uh, climate variability, um, all those things to try and understand um, the mean return and the standard deviations around that and how that returns to, to compares to other beta values within other investments. Um, so, uh, so we certainly do all that. Um, but of course, we rely purely on historical data over the last 100 years. And, and that's perfectly valid if, we, if you don't think climate change is an issue. But um, some of our country at Canamble, um, Western New South Wales, we pulled off 44,000 tonnes of grain, barley, wheat, etc. in 2016, 36,000 tonnes in 17, and we haven't sown a, a thing this year. So is that just part of the normal cycles of agriculture and seasons? Um, I, I don't think it is, and I think most people would say it's not. Um, so therefore your risk modelling, which is all based on historical data, sort of goes out the window. Um, so I think we're in a new world order in terms of understanding that risk and, and indeed pricing that risk. Um, and I've got to say, that's one of the appeals of Western Australia, you know, is that if you're in that, you know, safer zones where we've tended to buy the properties, um, we're always getting a crop, you know, whether it's 1.5 tonnes or whether it's 3.5 tonnes, but, you know, in, in the east, you just don't get a crop. Um, and I think that's the big difference. But how do you price it? That's, I think we're in a new world order of pricing risk around cl with climate change. Thank you all for your questions. We'll be some time to catch up with John McKillop later. Oh, thank you, Mr McKillop, for giving us your words of wisdom into the insight into agriculture and agribusiness internationally. We greatly appreciate you, f you flying to WA to be the orator of the 25th Muresk Lecture and continuing the historic, historical tradition. We'd like to present you with this token of our appreciation for making your time available today.